please join with me in our call to worship. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us worship God. God sent Christ into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. God's love endures forever. God is our refuge and strength, a present help in trouble. God's love endures forever. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. God's love endures forever. Let us pray. Gracious God, out of your love and mercy, you breathed into the dust the breath of your life, creating us to love you and our neighbors. As we begin this Lenten journey tonight, call forth our prayers and inspire our confessions. Strengthen us to face our mortality in such a way that it would spark repentance and stir us to a new way of obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading is from the prophet Joel, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and verses 12 through 17. Listen for and hear the word of God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful army comes. There like has never been from of old, nor will be again after them in ages to come. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering to the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a feast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the aged, gather the children, even infants at the breast, 
Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her canopy. And between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery, a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, Where is their God? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of my first jobs growing up was working for American Eagle Outfitters. I bought all my clothes there when I was in high school and in college. And so I thought, why not work there and get the employee discount as well? Oh, well, my time in retail, I learned a lot about the business. I learned that shoplifting was a big problem. We always had someone at the front of the store greeting people as they entered the store. The manager would check our bags uh, before closing, if we were closing the, the last shift and as we were leaving the store, he would check them to make sure there was nothing being taken. And taking inventory was a lengthy and tedious process that enabled the company to see if things were missing and to see if they could clear room for new inventory. We did these things because they were essential to keep a retail store like American Eagle running efficiently and effectively. In spite of all these efforts though to prevent theft, merchandise was stolen from the store, both internally and externally. They call it in the business, they call it shrinkage. Taking inventory helped know what the store had in stock and what was missing. And these concepts of internal shrinkage and taking inventory to free up space have applications, I believe, for us today on this Ash Wednesday. For if, if ever there is a day on the church calendar when taking stock of our spiritual lives is necessary, it's this one. Ash Wednesday, the day that launches us into the season of Lent. Well, this is certainly a good time to consider whether during the past year or so, whether we've experienced some internal shrinkage. Has something in our relationship with God been lost along the way? If so, what is it and how did it happen? Do we have a sense that we're not as happy or not in as close a relationship with God and maybe others as we used to be? If we take a hard look, do we find we're scarcely a shadow of our former spiritually robust selves? Ash Wednesday is inventory day. So it's time to make an honest appraisal. Steve Harper, who until his retirement was professor of spiritual formation at, at Asbury Seminary. He tells about being in a distant city, conducting a seminar on the spiritual life. Afterward, an active church member asked if he could drive Harper to the airport. En route, the man said to Harper, When I became a Christian, my life was radically changed. I was regularly and meaningfully involved in the church, but over a period of time, my enthusiasm waned until today I am a Christian mostly by habit. I've lost the, the joy of my faith, and sometimes I wonder if I'm really a Christian at all. Talk about internal shrinkage. Whew, wow, that's a tough one. Harper tells the story as, we, as the introduction to an article about spirituality, acknowledging that it's quite possible to become spiritually bored with and depressed about 
one's practice of faith. He also says, past experience is not automatically sufficient for the future. Harper goes on to talk about misconceptions we have about spirituality. And among them are these, and let me name them for you, four of them. The first one is this. It's the belief that having the right theology will promote spiritual vitality. He doesn't discount the value of theological truth. But Dr. Harper says that knowing and even believing such truth, such theology, doesn't produce vital spirituality. And he reminds us that John Wesley, the famous theologian and founder of, the, of Methodism, said it's possible to have, and I quote, a dead orthodoxy, a dead set of beliefs. Number two, misconception is that the belief that right experience will produce spiritual life. One such right experience is the conversion itself, which while important for following Jesus, is not the end of the quest, but rather the beginning. No single experience can sustain spirituality because feelings don't last and experience, well, they run their course. The third misconception, the belief that spirituality is an entity in, a, in itself, somehow divorced from the rest of life. Like we practice our spirituality over here and the rest of, we live our rest of our life over here. Real Christianity is not just a Jesus and me proposition. The Christian faith is a personal experience, but one that's practiced in the real world with real people dealing with real issues and real problems. And the fourth misconception is the belief that true spirituality is somehow reserved for a select few. Rather than that thought, we should all consider ourselves as prime candidates for a deeper walk with God. We are all able to have a deep and deeper relationship with God in Jesus Christ. So a spiritual inventory can enable us to see if we are being misled by one of these misconceptions I've named. But whatever we find during that internal review, the purpose of it is not to discover where we need a scolding or a slap on the hand, but where we need refreshing, renewal. This is a time for the kind of prayer that lays who we are before God. With all of our questions, with all of our skepticism, with all our pain and disappointment, failures, yes, and even depression. And it ask for God's aid in enabling us, enabling us to be who he calls us to be. The prophet Joel sets the inventory mood when he says these words, he says, Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart. Yes, it may need to be with, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. But the important thing is to return to God. To return to the Lord, your God. He's not here to scold us. For he is gracious and merciful, says in Joel's passage, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relents from punishing. But God does awaken within us the sense that we need to repent of where we've failed to live our faith. Such an inventory can enable us to free up room or what Joel calls rending our hearts. That is to make more space for the things of God. Hearts here refers to the part of us that responds to God. And to be more accurate today, we 
can substitute mines as the place where the inventory can take place. So the sense of emptying our minds can happen when we encounter a realm different from our everyday life when we get out of our habits and our routines, as it's happening this week with our winter weather and the loss of power and water and icy roads. Life is, looks very different than this, this week than it did the week before. And so it's those times when we can take an opportunity to renew ourselves, to renew and seek the Lord in our lives. When I was a youth pastor growing, growing back in the day when I was starting a ministry, I led youth on weekend retreats, away from, getting them away from their normal routines and the pressures and expectations of life. One of the goals of these retreats was to help the youth step out of their regular daily schedule, their daily routines, and to focus their attention on their spiritual life, their relationship with God and Christ, and also the community of believers of which they were a part. They had the opportunity to take a spiritual inventory of their lives, to see where God was most active, where they felt God was leading them, to leading them to go and to build closer, deeper relationships, not only with God, but with each other. On a retreat, when we're away in our, our normal surroundings, we can give our attention to new experiences and to new thoughts triggered by non-everyday events. It's a time when we can take stock of our spiritual life and I believe it'll help, it would help us lead, lead us to, to be refreshed and renewed in our relationship with Jesus. These things change our perspective on the usual everyday things when we see again when we again have to deal with them let us pray help me O oh Lord to put aside if only briefly the things that keep me from spiritual expansion and renewal direct me in my spiritual inventory and in my thinking so that I may draw nearer to Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Amen. Friends in Christ, every year at the time of the Christian Passover, we celebrate our redemption through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lent is a time to prepare for this celebration and to renew our life. In the Paschal Mystery. We begin this holy season by acknowledging our need for repentance and for the mercy and forgiveness proclaimed in the Gospel of Jesus Christ. I invite you, therefore, in the name of Jesus Christ, to observe a holy Lent by self-examination and penitence, by prayer and fasting, by works of love, and by reading and meditating on the Word of God. Let us bow before God, our Creator and Redeemer, and confess our sin. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your loving kindness, in your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. And so, you are justified when you speak, and upright in your judgment. Indeed, I have been wicked from my birth, a sinner from my mother's womb. For behold, you look for truth deep within me and will make me understand wisdom secretly. Purge me from my sin, and I shall be pure. Wash me, and I shall be clean indeed. Make me hear of joy and gladness, that the body you have broken may rejoice. 
Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your saving health again and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. I shall teach your ways to the wicked and sinners shall return to you. Deliver me from death, O God, and my tongue shall sing of your righteousness, O God of my salvation. Open my lips, O Lord, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. Had you desired it, I would have offered sacrifice, but you take no delight in burnt offering. The sacrifice of God is a troubled spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Restore us, O God, and let your anger depart from us. Favorably hear us, O God, for your mercy is great. Isaiah declares, If you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness, and your gloom be like the noonday. Let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God. I invite you to do so by going to our website, mbprez.org, and clicking on the Give button, and follow the instructions there on how you can give an offering to Almighty God through New Braunfels Presbyterian Church. If you're not comfortable with that, it's okay. We invite you to bring an offering via mail. Just place your gift, your offering, in an envelope and address it to the church, New Braunfels Presbyterian Church, 373 Howard Street, New Braunfels, Texas, 78130. Uh, also put at the bottom below that, Attention Roseanne. So she'll be sure to get that for you. Either way, your gift will be included and used for the glory of God, to lift up the lowly, to humble the proud, and to welcome the stranger.
Let us pray. Almighty God, you have created us out of the dust of the earth. May these ashes be for us a sign of our mortality and penitence and a reminder that only by your gracious gift are we given everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. In biblical times, ashes were used as a sign of repentance. You would cover your whole body with ashes and wear nothing but sackcloth for clothes. We use the ashes today as a sign of repentance as we enter this Lenten season. You received some ashes from the church in your Lent in a bag. Or perhaps you've made some of your own ashes. Simply add a few drops of cooking oil, whether it be canola or vegetable or olive, whatever, to those ashes and mix them up into like a, into a paste, kind of an ash paste, if you will, not too wet, not too dry. And it doesn't take a lot of ashes to make the mark of the cross on yourself or for folks in your family. Let us pray. God of compassion, through your Son, Jesus Christ, you reconciled your people to yourself. Following his example of prayer and fasting, may we obey you with willing hearts and serve one another in holy love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
May the God of peace make you holy in every way and keep your whole being, spirit, soul, and body free from every fault at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.